We're going to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20 this morning. 2 Chronicles 20. The theme that I want to speak on is looking to God alone. Looking to God alone. And we're going to see that through the example of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. You know, there are numerous accounts in the Bible of God intervening on behalf of his people in their distressing situations as they turn to him. He shows them his power, his deliverance, his, he expresses his love, his commitment to them, and he continues to do that today. For those who look to God alone, in any distressing situation, God wants to show himself to be very, very real. As you look to him in faith, in yieldedness, in surrender, in trust, and the Lord intervenes on our behalf. And this is illustrated for us in this account here in 2 Chronicles 20. It says in verse uh, 1, Now it came about after this, that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Munites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Now Jehoshaphat was one of the good kings. We know that in the northern kingdom Israel, the northern ten tribes, in the history of the kings there was not one good king, not a one of them. In the southern kingdom of Judah, I believe there were five. And Jehoshaphat was one of them. As you read the earlier chapters, Jehoshaphat had the word of God taught in all the cities of Judah. He established judges to oversee the people, to settle disputes according to the word of God. He was not without his faults, not without his failures, but the trajectory of his life and of his heart was for the will of God, for the purpose of God. And so he was one of the godly kings. He's one of the kings that um, David describes towards the end of his life. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, David wrote this. He says, The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men righteously, who rules in the fear of God, is as the light of the morning when the sun shines, a morning without clouds, when the tender grass springs out of the earth through sunshine after rain. A godly ruler, what a refreshing man. What a great aid to society. Would God that we had rulers like that in our world today. Proverbs says it's an abomination for kings to commit wicked acts for the throne is established on righteousness. And Jehoshaphat's throne was established on righteousness. But he received news that the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Munites, who were just a small gathering of various tribes, were going to come against Judah. And they weren't just coming <clears throat> to destroy Judah for the sake of destroying it, as we'll see later in the chapter, by virtue of the fact of how much spoil Judah took when they conquered these tribes. They came to inhabit it. They came to completely displace the people of God in Judah. It says in verse 2, Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, out of Aram, and behold, they are at Hazazon Tamar, that is, En Gedi. Now, the Dead Sea is a long, narrow sea, maybe about 55 miles from north to south, maybe about 10, 12 miles at the widest point east to west. On the northeast side of it was where Ammon dwelt. On the southeast side was Moab. And these Munites, these various little tribes, are probably down in the very southern eastern part of the Dead Sea. So you're on the west side of the Dead Sea, all the way most up to the top, 
about 25 miles to the west was Jerusalem. These Ammon and Moab and the Munites had come around, come up the western side, and they were in Ge at En Gedi, which is about 25 miles from Jerusalem, or about halfway up. And so they gave him the news of this large, large contingent coming against Jerusalem. You know, sometimes that's the way it happens. It, was, it wasn't, uh, they weren't coming against him to correct Judah, like later on the Babylonians would come against Judah to, to discipline them. There was faithfulness in Judah, from the king on down and throughout society. And almost out of nowhere, this alarming report comes of this band of people conspiring to displace Judah. Verse 3. Jehoshaphat was afraid. And usually that's the first response, isn't it? When certainly not just him, but anybody, even us, we hear some type of alarming report about something, a very quick response just rises up within us oftentimes is to be afraid. But look what Jehoshaphat did. He was afraid and he turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. The margin says he turned to set his face toward God. That was his first reaction. Not to necessarily become so overwhelmed that he would withdraw from the situation, but he set his face to seek God. He proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah, so Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord, and they came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat had reigned over them well. He had instructed them the value of seeking God. And now when they really needed him, they traveled to Judah, to Jerusalem, to, to together they might seek the Lord. And then in verses 5 to 13, we have Jehoshaphat's prayer. Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, O Lord, God, o Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? Are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. So first, he magnifies the power and the sovereignty of God. He didn't come whimpering, so to speak. He didn't come all of a sudden saying, help me, help me, help me. He first lifted his eyes to God himself and God's character. He said then, uh, in verse 7, Did you not, O God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary there for your name saying, should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. And he's hearkening back and reminding himself how God had been faithful ever since he has established the kingdom under David, and David, as a man of war, did not build the house, but Solomon, his son, did. And they built this great temple for God. And then you can go back in earlier chapters in Chron First Chronicles and in Second Kings and see at the dedication of this great temple, this wonderful prayer of Solomon's, and he prayed just what Jehoshaphat rehearsed. He said, if there is any calamity that befalls us, and we, set our, we gather here in this temple and set our face to you, so he's remi reminding himself of God's faithfulness and of God's promise. In verse 10, Now behold the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. They turned aside from them and did not destroy them. As they were traveling through the wilderness, out of Egypt, back in Numbers, onto the land of promise, 
and they were going to come through this land, the land of Ammon and the Moabites, and they would not let them through. And so God says, do not, do not get into war with them. They went around. They went a different path. He says, so now, verse 11, see how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, which you've given us as an inheritance? O our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That is a wonderful verse. That is a wonderful example for you and me in time of our distress. They were at their wit's end. They had a military, Judea, but not to the match of these people coming against them. And they were saying, Lord, we don't know what to do. You're the great God. You're the sovereign God. You're over all the nations. You've been faithful. Your promises have been fulfilled. We've called upon you at various times from this temple, even since it was built. We've relied on you. And now this great multitude is coming against us, far more powerful than we are. We don't know what to do. But he says, but our eyes are on you. And then it says in verse 13, all Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. You know, I think of a verse, I believe it's in Psalm 56, where the psalmist says, Lord, what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. I remember years ago, um, man, probably 20-something years ago, where we were in fellowship, we had a youth group once, we went camping. We had a little fun one night in the dark, and this one little fellow got pretty scared. And later on, we were hanging around the campfire talking, and this little guy, and he says, uh, I remember that verse, what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. I thought, wow. You know, who's, who, who's, who's being instructed here, the kids or me? You know, what a good example. What time I am afraid, I will trust in you. And that's what Jehoshaphat did. And that's what he led the nation to do. We have no idea what to do, Lord, but our eyes are upon you. And then we see in verse 14 through 19 the Lord's answer. Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, <clears throat> the son of Jeiel, the son of Mataniah, the Levite of the sons of Asaph. And he said, listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the king of Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. He said, wait a minute. He said, I know you don't know what to do, but you've got to keep this in mind first of all before I tell you what to do. The battle's not yours. It's mine. What assurance, what encouragement that would have given to them. He says, now tomorrow, go down against them. And he's about to give them a very unusual strategy. There are other occasions in, in the Old Testament history when God's people were facing battles, particularly when they came into the Promised Land after crossing into Jordan and throughout the book of Joshua. Tremendous military campaign. And then even later, later on in the campaigns of David, at times the Lord would give them instruction, specific military strategy. But the strategy here was not a military one. But the Lord said, the battle's mine, it's not yours. Here's what he said to them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and will, you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel, which was about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. So really, for an, an army of this magnitude coming against them, it was almost as if they were at their back door. He says in verse 17, you need not fight in this battle. Station, station yourselves. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. He repeats it again. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, Go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. 
So he gives them the strategy. He says, you're going to go out tomorrow, and basically you're just going to position yourself where you can see them. He says, but I am going to fight for you. So Jehoshaphat, verse 18, bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. The Levites from the sons of the Kohathites and of the sons of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. You have, we see this, this contagion here of, Josh, of Jehoshaphat trusting the Lord, and we see leading them in prayer, and now the people are beginning to trust him as evidenced by their worship, by their praise. I mean, really, think about it. It's like the possibility exists that tomorrow we're done with, we're over, we're dead, our land's gone and possessed by another. But they're out there worshiping the Lord, having received the response from God. We see in verse 20, we see their experience of deliverance. So they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. So twice he reminds them, trust him. Trust the Lord. Trust him. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. When they began singing and praising, so here's the strategy. They've got the military there, but yet the military were not going to be used. But in front of the military, facing the onslaught of the enemy, are those who sing. Those who are appointed of the... the um, the Kohathites and the Korites and the other singers of the temple. They're praising God. They're worshiping God. And then it goes to say, when they began singing and praising, verse 22, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah. So they were routed. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. And so there became this tremendous disarray. So at first, Moab and Ammon, who are very powerful, are fighting against this smaller group of tribes. And then after that, then they turn on one another and they destroy themselves. While Israel sings, praises, worships, and watches. And then it says there, when Judah came to the lookout of the wilderness, verse 24, they looked toward the multitude, and behold, they were corpses lying on the ground, and no one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found much among them, including goods and garments and valuable things, which they took for themselves, more than they could carry. And they were three days taking the spoil because there was so much. That is, this contingent came not just with the... Um, the implements of battle. You see, they came with so much stuff. They came to live there. They came to take over and dwell in Judah. And then we see in verses 26 to 30 how God had given them peace and rest. Then on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barakah, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore they have named that place the Valley of Baraka until this day. The Valley of Baraka means the Valley of Blessing. It could very well have been the Valley of Slaughter it was a Valley of Blessing because they looked to God alone. Every man of Judea and Jerusalem returned with Jehoshaphat at their head, returning to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. They came to Jerusalem with harps, lyres, and trumpets to the houses of the Lord, to the house of the Lord. And the dread of God was on all the kingdoms of the lands when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. 
So the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace. For as God gave him rest on all sides. What peace had the Lord brought? From this terrible alarming news that struck fear in Jehoshaphat. And now, peace. Because they looked to God alone, they rested in him, they put their trust in him, they followed his leading and how to meet the battle, to meet their distress, and God fought for them and brought them into great rest. Let's look at just, as we close here, four values I think we can learn from this passage. The first one is the nature of fear. The nature of fear. Remember the news came, and when Jehoshaphat first heard of it, it said, and Jeho Jehoshaphat was afraid. Which is a very natural response. And fear can arise in a moment. Some alarming news, some terrible phone call, some whatever. It can arise in a moment. And you know, but fear, fear rarely comes alone. It usually brings a couple of its friends with it. Worry and doubt. And those, that triumvirate is a pretty tough enemy. A pretty tough enemy. Fear can take hold. Fear can knock the wind out of your soul. You know, in, uh, in Luke chapter 21, the Lord is giving uh, a prophetic information about the end times. And he's saying that the nations will become so overwhelmed, it says men's hearts will fail with fear. Will fail with fear. Um, and the word fail in that passage, the Greek word means literally means to breathe out. We all know what it's like when we've been kids. You, know, you get the wind knocked out of you, are playing sports or something, and it takes a while. To, you know, you're, you're kind of dead in the water until you get that wind back. Fear, you might say, can knock the wind out of, your, out of your soul, the life out of you, the vitality out of you. But what did Jehoshaphat do? He turned to the Lord, didn't he? He immediately turned to him. Remember that verse we quoted, what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. You know, in Mark chapter 8, there was a situation uh, a man that Jairus faced. He was a leader of the synagogue. And he was a good man. And his only daughter was, was at the point of death. And so he went to find Jesus to bring him back, or at least to ask for healing. And he found him, and, he, and Jesus began to return to Jairus' house. And um, along the way, there was a woman who had an issue of blood for a number of years, came before him, touched, touched the hem of his garment. Lord, who touched me? And, uh, and the Lord healed her. Well, uh, uh, as he healed her, members of Jairus' household came and found Jesus and Jairus and said, don't bother Jesus any longer. He says, your daughter's died. And what Jesus did immediately, immediately, he didn't respond to the messenger. He looked directly at Jairus. He said, be not afraid. Be not afraid. Think of um, in uh, uh, John 14, when the Lord is gathered with his disciples, preparing them for his departure. He told them, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Twice here in this chapter, there are people who are reminded, be not afraid or dismayed. Trust in the Lord. The nature of fear, it can grip us, but don't stay there. Don't stay there. Turn to the Lord. And the second value is the value of prayer. The value of prayer. And we learn that from this prayer here of Jehoshaphat. First off, prayer focuses on the power and the might of God. You know, before Jehoshaphat explained their problem, he first lifted his vision to God. He didn't just run into the presence of God, Lord, we've got problems, you've got to help, I need you, need you, need you, need you. But he first began to worship and to lift his eye upon the character of God. Fear, fo 
uh, prayer f- focuses on the power and the might of God. Prayer recalls the faithfulness of God. Has God ever in your life, ever once been unfaithful? We have to look back and think, not a one. Absolutely not. Not once has God ever been unfaithful. He never will be unfaithful. Prayer acknowledges our weakness and our need. He said, Lord, they're coming against us. We have no idea what to do. No idea what to do. But also, prayer looks to God alone. For he said, Lord, our eyes are upon you. You know, the psalmist says, cast your burden on the Lord. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. And lastly, remember, prayer is answered. Prayers are answered. God doesn't ignore you. God doesn't turn a deaf ear to you when you come in faith, in dependence, looking to God alone. God will answer. How he will answer? You never really know, but he will. He will. And when he does, you'll realize he answered it just perfectly. Just perfectly. The third value simply is the power of praise. The power of of praise. Again, quite an unusual military strategy they had, wasn't it? He didn't say, okay, you, you think, take half the army and send them down here, and half the army maybe have hold back, and half the army take a northern flank. He said, no, their army's out there, but in front of them, he says, take the singers and those who lead in worship. He says, because the battle is mine. The battle is mine. It reminds me of Acts chapter 16. There at Philippi, Paul and Silas on their missionary journey were seized, thrown into a jail. And that night, they began to sing and praise God in the prison. And the prison gates became unlocked as they sung and praised. That's pretty amazing. The power of praise. The power of praise. Uh, I think of... um, Psalm 46 and verse 10, he says, Be still and know that I am God. What praise. You know, hey, we all have different difficulties. We all have times of distress. But don't forget to praise God. Don't forget to lift him up in those times. And then lastly, simply, uh, the blessedness of peace and rest. They came there to that valley of Barakah, which literally means a valley of blessing. And God fought for them. God got the victory for them. It says, and God established them, and God gave them peace and rest there in Judah. Look at um, another verse in Philippians chapter 4. It's a good verse to keep in mind. In verse 6, he says, Be anxious for nothing. Don't be worked up and worried about anything. That's that's pretty hard. But he says, here's what to do when you find yourself in that way. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that word guard there, it's it's a military term. The idea will garrison. It's as if you're in the center of a military garrison and they are completely around you, protecting you. And he says that when we cast everything upon the Lord, bring everything to him, not just by prayer and supplications, but with thanksgiving, it says the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. In Psalm 62, well, I had it on the tip of my tongue, but I forgot it. I'll have to read it to you. Twice in this psalm, you know, if, the, if a passage of Scripture has something repeated twice, it's pretty important. In verse 1, he says, My soul, wait in silence for God only. From him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. So let's be those, follow the example of a godly Jehoshaphat. 
whatever the distress might be, whatever the alarming news might be, will look to God alone. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for your power and for your greatness. We thank you for your promise. We thank you, Lord, you're faithful. We thank you, Heavenly Father, we can draw near in prayer. We thank you, Lord, we have confidence that not only do you hear us, but you will answer. We pray, Heavenly Father, enable us to walk closely with you, to know that blessing, to know your peace and rest. Lord, we worship you and we praise you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.